on the brain's response to trauma, what actually happens inside our brain and what happens inside our body when we experience trauma and how that manifests itself physically, emotionally, behaviorally, cognitively, how we see all of those different um, manifestations of that um, in different ways. So that's kind of the basis of where we're going. And I, I know that a lot of you probably have some training and some experience, you're professionals, um, and so you have some ideas about that. So as I'm talking today, my goal is to either expand your knowledge in that area, or if you have some great training and understanding in that area already, hopefully I'll use some examples or some, some different analogies that might help you better serve um, someone that you're working with, a client or a friend or a neighbor or a family member. Um, maybe it, this will give you an example or an analogy that you can use with them to help them better understand what's actually happening inside their body. Um, so with just some basic level understanding um, principles for us to get started with, um, I want to, everybody to understand that trauma is really about an experience. Trauma is something that happens and whatever that was that happened, it leaves us feeling either hopeless or helpless or fearful. So think about all of the experiences that we have on a daily basis. And if I have an encounter that leaves me feeling hopeless or helpless or fearful, that means there's the potential for a physiological traumatic response to happen inside my body. Not just the event and emotionally how I experience it, but there actually could be something that changes physiologically inside my body because of that event. And so we're gonna talk about that when we, ex when we have those experiences that leave us feeling hopeless or helpless or fearful. I want you to remember those three words. There's always the potential that that physiological response might come up. The other important thing to realize is that I don't really have to be in danger but if my brain perceives the situation to be dangerous, then it can elicit that physiological response. I don't really have to be in danger. It doesn't really have to be a threat. The situation may not really be hopeless, but if my brain perceives it to be any of those, then there's the potential that the physiological response happens anyway. The other thing that I think is a baseline understanding that we need to talk about is really just understanding that, that there's sometimes a connection between trauma and grief. We typically think of grief as in the association of a loss with death, but we grief is really our natural response to any type of loss. So I think uh, today, you know, I heard on the news again today about all of the wildfires that are happening in the West. So those people are losing homes, they're losing livelihoods, they may be losing loved ones in the fire or pets in the fire. Um, vehicles. I mean, we see these devastating pictures, right? So those are still losses. And while it, we would all agree that that is a traumatic experience, some of their feelings and some of their experiences may also be connected to a grieving response because of the loss of different types of things. So it's important for us to recognize that sometimes when we see um, certain symptoms in individuals, those may be produced by the trauma response, but they also may be related to grief. And so we have to distinguish between those. The other thing that I think is a baseline understanding that I wanna put out on the table right away is really understanding that trauma isn't always just a one-time exposure. We typically think of traumatic experiences as a one-time event. The fire, the flood, the hurricane, the tornado, um, the assault, um, the, the traffic accident. We typically think of trauma as these singular events. But there are, there are individuals that experience multiple events a day that create that same type of traumatic response inside their body. So they, they are living in a heightened chronic state of traumatic response. And it, it may not be tied to just one singular event. So what does that mean about how we're exposed to trauma? Well, we know that um, understandably it could be happening to me. I can, uh, I can have the traumatic response that we're gonna talk about if something happens to me. I can have that physiological response if I watch it happen to someone else. I can have that same physiological response happen in my body if something's happening to someone that I'm close to, someone that I'm related to, a family member, or that I have a close relationship to. If I have a sibling 
that has that is chronically ill. If I have a sibling that's that's suffering from a, a terrible illness, that certainly has the potential to leave me feeling helpless and hopeless and fearful at different times. So even though it's maybe not happening directly to me because I have a relationship to them, I can still have the same physiological response inside my body that they may be having because it's happening directly to them. And then in the last 20 years, our research and understanding has really changed related to this last bullet because prior to 9-11, most people believed that you didn't have a traumatic response unless you were impacted by one of those first three ways. But following 9-11 and since, in the last 20 years basically, there's been a lot of research that has come out that has really proven that we don't have to be that connected to it. If we just see it or hear it or hear about it, it can still create that traumatic response inside my body. And I'll give you a perfect example. We, we just reflected on September 11th. Um, you saw things on the news and in the newspaper about that. Um, for those of you that are on here that are old enough to remember that event specifically, um, I remember, I don't remember what I ate for lunch yesterday. And I don't know where you are on that, but I really truly don't remember what I ate for lunch yesterday. But on September 11th, 2001, I remember very distinctly where I was, what I was doing. I remember the feel of the chair I was sitting in. And it happened to be that my husband and I worked in similar, we worked in schools that were near each other. So we were carpooling at the time. And I have a very distinct memory of the conversation that we had on the way home after school that day. I don't remember what I ate for lunch yesterday, but I recall in specific detail what we talked about 19 years ago on that day. The reason we record the, that, that I recall such specific details is because my brain recorded that day differently than it did yesterday. The, the physiology inside my body, what was happening inside my body as I heard about that and watched that happening created such a response that those memories were recorded differently than my memories of yesterday. So I don't, I didn't know anybody on a plane. I didn't know anybody that worked in the World Trade Center or the Pentagon or that was on, um, that even lived in Pennsylvania or the other plane crash. I had no direct connections to it. The family that I had within the military were all retired. I wasn't worried about anybody being called to active duty. I had no direct connections to the event, but it still recorded those events differently in my brain because what was happening inside my body was different than when I ate lunch yesterday. And I can't remember that. And we have lots of new research about that. So that's important for us to know when we think about the world that we live in, where we literally have 24 hour a day access to the entire globe. We can hear and see about things that are happening all over the globe at any time on any multitude of devices, right? So that's important for us to understand when we talk about trauma exposure in individuals. It's also important for us to understand that that exposure looks different. For some people, they'll have a single exposure. So they'll have a fire, they'll have a traffic accident, they'll have a single exposure. Some people experience um, a similar type of exposure, but they have that exposure multiple times. So maybe I'm a child that lives in a house where domestic violence is prevalent. So I'm exposed to the same type of trauma but it, it happens repeatedly. Or maybe there's different things that are happening over different events that are happening over that time. And then there's also what we call type three trauma, which is really complex cumulative trauma. So I live in a situation where every day there are multiple different kinds of things that I experience that leave me feeling helpless and hopeless and fearful. They're eliciting that physiological response inside my body. So if I'm, let's just take a child of poverty to start with. A child that has food insecurities is going to have some feelings of hopelessness, selflessness, or fearfulness. If they live in an unsafe neighborhood and they're worried about drive-by shootings, they're worried about getting beat up, they're worried about all kinds of things that could be happening, they're having that physiological response inside their body for different reasons, but multiple times a day. That's what we consider complex cumulative trauma exposure. 
So for children, most of their traumatic experiences relate to things that disrupt their safety and security. So living in an unsafe or unstable environment, being separated from a parent, and that doesn't even have to be a negative, what we would perceive to be a negative separation from your parent, like if they were removed from a, a difficult home situation. There's all kinds of reasons that kids are separated from parents that we might not consider traumatic experiences. Um, they have a parent that's in the military that um, is deployed. Um, they have a parent that works offshore on an oil rig or is a long haul trucker and they're gone for long periods of time. Or they have parents that are divorced and it may be a very amicable divorce, but mom was here every day before and now I only see her on Wednesdays and every other weekend. So there can even be things that we wouldn't necessarily consider traumatic for kids sometimes that can be causing that physiological response inside their body. Obviously abuse um, or neglect um, are situations that have the potential to create this physiological response inside their body. Um, we talked about one-time events opposed to ongoing trauma. So think about, think about those kids that you know or those kids that you work with. It may have some of those situations on the right, that they are living with someone that has a chronic or life-threatening disease. They live in an unsafe neighborhood. They have an unstable home life. Um, they are subject to bullying or deliberate cruelty on a regular basis or domestic violence is prevalent. All of those events have the potential to be creating the physiological response inside their body that's causing certain symptoms or certain behaviors. One of the things that's important for us to know about childhood trauma is what that means for kids as they become adolescents. Um, so I spent a lot of years, um, over my half of my years in public schools were at middle school. I, I've been at every level, but um, I spent 12 years at middle school in some capacity, from teacher all the way up to principal. And I'd go back to middle school in a heartbeat, but they are special. Um, middle school kids are unique and special, whether you're parenting them or teaching them, they are unique and special. Um, and they can't help it. It's just part of their developmental period that they're in. And we just have to embrace all of that for what it is. But here's what we know about kids, specifically adolescents, that have experienced childhood trauma. We already know that adolescents are going to engage in all kinds of stupid behavior. We know that. We know they're going to engage in risky behavior. We know they're gonna experiment with different types of, of situations and different types of things. Um, we know that they engage in risky behavior. I used to tell parents all the time, it's why collectively as a society, we have decided they can't drive or vote or drink until a certain age because we know they're not gonna make good decisions, right? So why are we surprised when they don't make good decisions? We've already decided as a society they don't make good decisions. We know they're gonna engage in risky behaviors. What research tells us is that kids that experience trauma as children are even more likely than their peers to engage in risky behavior. So if we know all kids are going to do some crazy stuff, we better be mindful of the fact that kids that have experienced trauma are even more likely to engage in risky behaviors and, and know that that may be coming. And there's a reason that that's happening. It happens for all kids and it, that it's heightened for kids that have experienced trauma. So during those adolescent years that start about 11 and go on till maybe even well after high school, there's a part of their brain that is really active. And if we were in a room together instead of virtually, I would ask someone to answer this question. So I'm going to ask you, just think about what you would answer if I ask you right now. What is more important to an adolescent than anything else? What is more important than anything else? And if we were together, someone in that room, if not all of you, would say something about peer acceptance, right? Connections to their peers, whether they're liked by people around them or not, is so important to them. And there's, there's a physiological reason for that. There is a part of their brain that that social emotional part of their brain is more active during adolescence than any other time in their life. So they really can't help it. That part of their brain is constantly saying, will people like this? Will this be cool? Will this get me a million likes on Instagram? There is a part of their brain that everything is being filtered through and their thoughts and their words and their actions are all driven by, is this going to help me create a connection with one of my peers? Is this going to be perceived as cool? Is everybody going to think this is funny? Are people going to like this? There's a part of their brain that's filtering all their decisions. 
There's another part of their brain, which we would prefer that they use, that is responsible for rational decision making, critical thinking, really helping them filter that out. So this part of their brain is going, this is so awesome. You should totally do this. This is going to get like a million likes on Instagram. And the part of their brain that should be saying, you might get a million likes on Instagram, but I'm still not sure that's a good idea. That part of their brain isn't fully developed. So you have this constant struggle. That's in all adolescents. It's heightened for kids that have had traumatic experiences. And especially those with complex cumulative trauma that have that continual disruption in the physiology of their stress response, that separation is even more heightened in those kids. So the best, if you have not seen this video, I'm going to show you, I think it's really the best example of anything that I've ever seen. It was shared with me by a colleague, uh, Marilyn Grubbs, um, who was a school counselor herself, an educator and then a school counselor. And um, she's an LPC. She's in private practice now. She actually works at Paloma Place um, and, and does some private practice. She shared a video that Dr. Russ Harris did. And this video is really about the hand model of the brain. And I'm going to share the video with you real quickly. Um, but if you want to go back to it later, all you have to do is go to YouTube and search for the three main parts of your brain. And actually, you're going to find a ton of really amazing videos that Dr. Russ Harris does. But I want to share this with you really quick. I think I have it set correctly, Chloe. But on my end, all I can see is my PowerPoint. I can't even see the chat. So you're going to have to pipe in and let me know if you can't hear the sound or the video. Now, you probably know the name Dan Siegel. He's one of the giants in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. And Dan came up with a lovely hand model of the human brain. So let's kind of go through the hand model of the brain. And this can be useful for you to understand, but at times it might be useful for you to actually share this with your client. The wrist, the forearm, coming up to here is like your spinal cord. And right here at the, uh, the end of the wrist is like the base of your skull. And here, the bottom of your palm, this is like the reptile brain, the life support system of the brain. So, you know, if the rest of your brain is wiped out through, say, for example, yeah. a stroke or yeah. a car accident, the, it's life support part of your brain, the, the sound, reptile brain. The sound is great, but the video, for some reason, isn't, isn't playing. But It's not showing the video. Um, I did send out the slides um, in the email to get into this, and I'm also going to include your slides in the recap. So if anyone That's great. wants to see it, I'll be sure that that video, maybe even the video is linked separately, just in case. So I'll take care of that for you. So, That'll oh, be okay. great. All right, so I'm going to skip the video, and you guys go back and watch it on your own. Can you see my PowerPoint screen again? Yes. OK, great. So thanks for letting me know that, Chloe. So. I promise you Dr. Harris does a way better job of this than I am, but I'm going to give you the short version of it. So he talks about these three parts of your brain and he uses the hand to do it. So this is sort of like the, the end of your spinal column that your, your vital functioning happens at this part of your brain. This is what, this is all your autonomic system. So you don't, your respiration, your heart rate, that all happens in this part of your brain. And then you have this emotional core of your brain. And then in this emotional core of your brain, this is connected to survival. So your emotions are also connected to those instinctual responses of fight, flight, or freeze, right? So it's this emotional core of your brain that decides if there is a perceived threat and do I need to fight it or run away from it? Or do I need to just curl up in a ball and let that saber tooth tiger maul me? And then I'll have enough energy left in my cells for my body to recover afterwards. That's what freeze is about, right? So we talked a little bit about that fight, flight, or freeze response, but it comes from this emotional core of your brain. And then he talks about this thinking part of your brain. He calls it the thinking cap of your brain. And this thinking part of your brain is where all that rational decision making happens apart from the emotional part of your brain the emotional core of your brain this is where rational thinking happens this is where your speech is this is this is all that good decision making that all happens in this thinking part of your brain so he goes on to talk about when how when this part of our brain is responding when this part of our brain is making the decisions then we have less access to this part of our brain 
So as we, as we move forward, now I can't get my slide to advance. There we go. Look at this imaging. This is a perfect imaging of what um, Dr. Harris talks about in that video. The brain on the left is a scan of a brain that's functioning the way it's supposed to. You'll notice that multiple parts are lit up and while it's, while it's two dimensional and flat, it's really happening all across the brain and all the different parts of the brain. But then when you are experiencing stress, when you are depressed, when you've experienced something that has created a traumatic response in your body, that's what your brain looks like on the right. Notice it begins to resort back to just this inner core emotional part of your brain. That's where your thinking is happening. That's where your decision is, decisions making, what you're saying and doing is coming from this part of your brain, not this part of your brain. It's important for us to understand that. And the way that your brain does that is by controlling different neurotransmitters and hormones that are in your body. So I used to teach seventh grade science a long, long time ago. So we're going to back up and for a couple of slides, we're going to have a seventh grade science license lesson. So the way that your body does that is by, um, sorry, my dog is scratching at the door. One of those, um, uh, joys of working from home. Right. So one of the ways your body does that is by controlling the amount of dopamine that's in our system. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter that this part of your brain decides how much you should have. Okay. And it's most, it's responsible for a lot of things, but most closely associated with pleasure and reward, um, closely associated with addicts, right? Another one is serotonin, which when we have enough serotonin in our sense, in our system, we have this general sense of well-being and I'm happy. I feel good. But as I have less serotonin in myself, I'm not feeling so good, right? Most antidepressants are serotonin uptake inhibitors. And what they do is they keep our bodies from absorbing the serotonin. So my body releases serotonin. I take that serotonin uptake inhibitor. It stays in my body longer and doesn't get absorbed and disappear from my system. And I maintain that sense of well being for a longer period of time. There's norepinephrine that this part of our brain decides when and how much, right? Norepinephrine in our system is responsible for vascular constriction. It increases our heart rate and our blood pressure, and it increases the amount of sugar in our blood. So again, if we were in a room together, I'd ask someone to tell me, why do we need sugar in our blood? So think about that for a second. We use sugar in our blood for energy, right? That's, there's a whole process. It's called ATP, they, the cells use ATP. And it's called cellular respiration. It's how our cells break down this sugar inside our blood to get the energy that they need, whether it's your brain cells or your muscle cells, whatever it is, they use the sugar in our blood to, to make that happen. Another um, response of this part of the brain is the, determines how much oxytocin you have in your system. Oxytocin is sometimes referred to as the love hormone because oxytocin is how relationships are formed. So you know when a baby's born, we know that that skin-to-skin -skin contact is really important when a baby's first born because that skin-to-skin -skin contact tells both parties, both brains from here, that they should release oxytocin. And it's when the bond between that parent and child begins to form, right? If you're working with someone specifically with children, really anybody, but if you're, you're trying to have a conversation with somebody and build a relationship with them, if they aren't getting an oxytocin dump, they're not developing trust in that relationship. And you know what this feels like because you've had situations where you met someone and you know those times where you meet somebody and like instantly you get that funky vibe and you're like, mm, something's just not right, right? We've all had those experiences, right? That is because for whatever reason, this part of your brain decided in like that much time that that's not somebody you need to have a relationship with. And so it didn't release oxytocin. It's why you didn't feel immediately a connection with that person. On the other hand, you've had experiences where you met somebody and instantly you knew you were going to be fast friends. Like you just clicked from the beginning. You knew if you'd have met 10 years ago, you'd have been friends. If you're still going to be 10, uh, friends with each other 10 years from now, probably because for whatever reason, this part of your brain said, hey, that person, somebody you might want to have a relationship with and theirs did too. And you both got an oxytocin dump. So the bond formed immediately. So that's something else that this part of your brain controls. 
epinephrine and adrenaline, you know all about adrenaline, right? We know that when we have tons of adrenaline, we can do things that we don't normally do. People lift cars off of other people, right? And that really is because it pairs with the norepinephrine, which had a bunch of sugar in our system. And now my heart rate's up and my blood pressure's up and I'm actually processing that sugar faster than I ever have. The sheer sugar metabolism goes up when you have epinephrine and adrenaline in your system. And so what happens is you've got this extra sugar in your system and then your cells break it down really fast. So they really are stronger and faster doing things that they couldn't do before. It happens in a real short amount of time and it only lasts for a real short amount of time, but you really are stronger and faster than you've ever been in your life because you're breaking down those sugars faster and than you normally do and your body has more access to energy. And then the last neurotransmitter and hormone I wanna to talk to you about is cortisol. So if we were in line at HEB and you were standing there waiting to check out reading the headlines and one of those headlines is about cortisol, you would probably tell me that it has something to do with stress and it makes us fat, right? That's what we've all heard about cortisol is it has something to do with stress and it makes me fat, which is kind of true. When this part of your brain detects something that's stressful, detects something that may not be quite right, that this might be a threat, that something's perceived to be wrong, and it begins to activate your stress response, one of the things that might get released is cortisol. Well, cortisol doesn't actually make you fat. What cortisol does is it tells your liver to make a boatload of sugar. I mean like a lot, a lot of sugar. Because remember you have norepinephrine, which is in spreading that sugar throughout your bloodstream. And then you've got epinephrine and adrenaline and it's gonna break it down really fast. So you need a lot of it, right? But, it's telling your, this part of your brain is telling your body, I need a boatload of sugar because I'm fixing to have to fight or run, or I'm going to need a lot of it to recover after the tiger mauls me. But if you don't fight and you don't run and you don't need all of that later to, for your body to recover, guess what happens to all of that extra sugar that your liver just produced? You're right. It turns to fat. So cortisol does kind of make us fat and it is kind of connected to stress, but it's really about the sugar that your liver produces when cortisol is present. So I always tell people that when you have a really stressful day at work um, and you want to go home and drink a whole bottle of wine, or you want to go home and, and have a whole six pack, or you want to go home and just eat like a dozen hot chocolate chip cookies, remember that you already got fatter today because you had a big cortisol dump, because you got that email from your boss and you kind of freaked out and you didn't run and you didn't fight and all of that sugar is just gonna turn to fat already. So you don't wanna add any more on top of that, right? So what does that actually mean in our bodies? So this part of your brain, which is called the amygdala, is really the one that's gonna decide, is this a threat or is this not a threat? Do I perceive that this could be a risk? And then it begins to activate that stress response. And so you're taking this information in through your senses. It's going to this emotional core of your brain. And then this part of your brain's deciding, what's my best bet here? How is the best way for me to overcome this? Should I fight? Should I run? Should I freeze and curl up in a ball and be ready to recover? This part of your brain's really making that decision in a split second. And then releasing whatever it needs to release so that you're primed and ready to go for that. I saw this analogy. Um, from a presenter at Star Commonwealth. So if someone will type that in the chat, it's actually with two R's, S-T-A-R-R, -R, Commonwealth. Fabulous resource, um, great trainings um, about trauma and grief. Um, so one of their trainers used this analogy and I think it's fabulous. I use it all the time with teachers um, and counselors when I work with them. And I think it's a great example to really help us understand how that fight or, fight or flight response takes over our bodies because of what's happening physiologically. So I want you to think of amygdala, not as this little part of your brain, but that is that guy's name. He's this Roman soldier and his name is amygdala, okay? It actually came from the Greek word of almond. That's where they got that name. So we're gonna use this Roman soldier as our amygdala, okay? And amygdala is solely responsible for your survival. Whether you live or die every day is his responsibility, which I feel pretty good about, because look at him. I mean, like, he's obviously well-trained, He's strong, he looks fast, he's, he's got weapons, he looks like he knows how to use them. I feel pretty good about that, right? I think he can keep me alive. Here's how amygdala responds. 
as soon as he says, hey, this may not be right, as soon as he perceives something to be a threat, whether it's real or not, as soon as he perceives something to be a threat, he begins to activate your stress response. He begins to control those, neuros and those neurotransmitters and hormones that are in your body. And then he calls somebody up. So in every person, amygdala has somebody on speed dial. And he actually has access to all of these people, but in most of us, he has somebody that he always calls first. He either calls that guy, or he calls that guy, or he calls that guy. Confession, my amygdala on speed dial, he has the Hulk. I am really quick to get bowed up, y'all. I am the person that my first instinct is like, I cannot believe you just said that. And I'm like bowed up, ready to go. It doesn't mean that there aren't times where amygdala has called the roadrunner and I have just like been looking for the exit. Like I have just, I clearly don't need to be in this space right now. How do I get out of here? And there's also times which you may have experienced too, you know, like, um, you're sitting in a conference room and then the table at that end of that conversation turns and all you want to do is become invisible. You're just like, okay, if I just, I'm going to look away and I'm going to pretend like I'm not paying attention and you're going to duck your head because you just want to crawl under the table and disappear because of what's happening down there, right? Sometimes amygdala calls different people for us based on the, his perception of the situation, but instinctually he tends to call one more than others in us and in kids, right? The other thing that amygdala does is because he's responsible for your survival, he begins to cut off communication between him and this part of your brain. He is in charge. He doesn't want you to figure this out. He doesn't want you to be thinking about how to get out of this situation. He's in charge. So he begins to cut off communication between this part of your brain where he lives and makes decisions and this part of your brain where you get to make decisions, right? Where you think rationally and make those decisions. So perfect example, you're driving down the road, all of a sudden a bunch of brake lights. You don't think about it. Amygdala makes you take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake instinctually, right? He instinctually decides, ooh, brake lights are bad. He's learned that over time, that brake lights are a sign that there may be trouble ahead. And so he, he makes you take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake. He doesn't give you as much access to this part of your brain where you can go, I think we're about a quarter of a mile apart and we're probably both going about 65. So I probably have about three seconds before I really need to break. If I just take my foot off the gas and wait, then I can kind of decide, am I gonna need to break? Or do I have enough room to move over on my left and right? Or I've already met my deductible. So if I run into him, it's not gonna matter anyway. He doesn't want you to rationalize all of that. He's in charge. So he begins to cut off communication between these two parts of your brain so that you just instinctually take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake, right? He's in charge. The other thing that amygdala is, doing, amygdala is doing is keeping track of all kinds of stuff. Everything that he ever perceived to be a threat, whether it turned out to be a threat or not, he kept a list up. He's been keeping this list your whole life. And every time something got perceived as a threat, he wrote it down and he's beginning to correlate all of that. Like, this is what happened the first time that experience came up. And then this is what happened the next time that experience came up. And then this is what happened the next time that experience came up. And it's helping him make better predictions about how you should respond. He's keeping track of all of that inside your head. So here's, here's one way that that might work. You go to fly for the first time. You get ready to get on a plane. You've never flown before. This is a new experience. Amygdala is a little anxious, right? Because this is new. He doesn't know about this. So he's already got your stress response a little bit elevated. He's trying to figure this out. You get on the plane, you get up in the air, you're feeling anxious already, and then you hit a bunch of turbulence. And amygdala all of a sudden goes, this cannot be right. And he amps up your stress response. So now you're trying to get that stupid little fan, that stupid little vent to open because it's clearly not blowing enough air out and you're sweating, you're fanning yourself. You may be flushed because your blood pressure is up. You're sweating. He's got this whole stress response raging inside your body. And then the turbulence stop and you land and everything is fine. And the next time you go to fly, he's like, okay, yeah, this didn't go well last time. So he might have you a little bit more anxious and you get up and there's turbulence, but everything turns out fine and you land. And then the same thing happens and the same thing happens and the same thing happens. And eventually amygdala, because he's been correlating this list over time, he's learned that it doesn't feel good and I don't like it, but it's not a threat, right? So eventually over time, while he may still have your stress response activated, it may not be as elevated as it, wanted, as it, uh, as it was at one point, right? 
It also works like this. Imagine this, you're an 11 year old boy. And every time an adult in your house starts yelling, somebody gets hit. And amygdala knows that because a month ago it was your sister and three weeks ago it was you and two weeks ago it was your brother. And then last night it was you again. And now you're standing here and there's an adult in front of you yelling. And so amygdala has been keeping this list and he knows that when an adult start yelling, someone's fixing to get hit, right? But what amygdala doesn't know is he's begun to cut off access between this part of your brain and this part of your brain. And in this part of your brain, you realize that that's really just Mrs. Mann. And I don't know why Mrs. Mann is up there losing her mind. I think it has something to do with Chloe didn't bring her homework again, but I don't know why she's losing her mind. In this part of your brain, you know that Mrs. Mann is not the adult that hits when they start yelling. You know that this is, in this part of your brain, you know this is school, not your house. In this part of your brain, you know all kinds of things that would help you realize that amygdala should stand down. But amygdala has cut off access to this part of your brain. So all you know is you're an 11-year-old 11 11 boy. You're sitting in Mrs. Mann's classroom who's like lost her mind up there in front of the room. And he happens to call the Hulk because that's who he calls for you right? And so now I'm like anxious in my seat because he's got all this pumping and my, my fists are ready to go because I'm fixing to have to stand my ground because when an adult starts yelling, somebody gets hit and he's called the Hulk so I can be prepared. And I'm a little fidgety. And so my buddy next to me elbows me to get me to pay attention. And what do I do? I'm going to slug him, right? I'm going to haul off and hit him. Not me. Amygdala is going to haul off and hit him, right? I didn't have the wherewithal from this part of my brain to rationalize for amygdala that this was a different situation. Now amygdala is keeping that list and he may begin to change his, his response over time. But right now in this moment, amygdala made that decision for me, not me about how to respond. When that stress response is activated, when amygdala takes over and he's called somebody and he's got you primed and ready to go, we may be feeling the effects of that in all kinds of different ways. It's not uncommon to have significant physical symptoms or significant emotional symptoms when your stress response is elevated. It's not uncommon to be, have trouble sleeping or have a rapid heart rate or even feel aches and pains in your body or gastrointestinal issues, to be irritable, to, to um, have less inhibition, to be more actively, to more actively engage in things that you wouldn't do before, um, to be oversensitive to comments, and become defensive about things. All of those could be very common sayings for us that someone's stress response might be activated, right? Behavioral and cognitive systems are also very likely to be prevalent. Um, engaging in self-destructive behaviors, trouble concentrating, um, rapid movement or really sluggish movement, um, confusion, fogginess, um, can't remember things like you've lost your keys for the fifth time today. Um, those are all very common signs that someone's stress response might be activated, right? All of those we could be experiencing due to the physiological things that happen inside my body. It has nothing to do with my cognitive abilities in general. It has everything to do with the fact that amygdala has activated the stress response. So he's more in control than this part of my brain is right? What's important for us to really understand that it is not uncommon for those symptoms, any of those symptoms that I just highlighted on those last two slides, it's not uncommon for those to show up for four to six weeks after that stress response is activated. But after that stress, after that time period, after four to six weeks, if you're still experiencing those to a significant level, then that means that your body chemistry is out of whack. That means that all of that stuff that amygdala got started, your body hasn't been able to resolve. And it's why you're still having sluggishness. It's why you still can't concentrate. It's why you're struggling with memory. It's why you're still irritable. It's why you're still engaging in some type of compulsive behavior. Your physiology is just out of whack. And beyond that four to six week period, when you're still experiencing those things, that might mean it's time to go get some help. You might need to have counseling or therapy about it. You might need some medication. You might need to do something different to get your body chemistry back in, in check, right? I think it's really important for us to, to stop right now 
while we're talking about this and address that in terms of the pandemic. Because it's really been six months, right? And since it kind of all started about mid-March for, for our world and our society, and everybody, regardless of the depth of your connection, whether you've had it or you know someone that's had it or you know someone that's died from it, you may have had a family member that's been ill with it, even if you don't have those kinds of close connections to it, everybody's life has been disrupted to some part, right? Like I'm working from home and my dog's scratching at the door. That's not something I typically have to deal with when I'm training because I'm in the room with you. Um, everybody has been impacted to some extent. So it's not uncommon for any of us to be experiencing any of those symptoms right now. That would not be an uncommon um, thing to be happening. The other thing that we have to be mindful of is we don't really know what the end of this looks like or when the end of this is coming. So we've been in this having some level of hopelessness, helplessness, fearfulness, to some extent, disruption to our lives that might have elicited that traumatic response. We've been in it for six months. We don't know what the end looks like. So it's important for us to remember that there's probably a lot of people walking around, including ourselves, whose body chemistry is just a little bit out of whack. And we don't know when that might be in check in the future, but we know that those symptoms might persist for a, a quite a bit of time, whether it's in ourselves or within our family members or in people that we're working with and trying to help. Um, the pandemic has created some level of traumatic stress for everyone across the globe. And so we just need to be mindful that people that may behave in ways that we don't typically see or we're not used to seeing, that may be just their traumatic response. It may not be them. It may be amygdala that's making them say or do those things. So I just think that that's an important reflection at this time um, because it's a unique experience for all of us. Um, it was quick and it was short and I wish we were together, but I hope that you've at least taken something away from today that um, that was beneficial or that you could use with someone or at least help with yourself if you're struggling with some of your own things. Um, I do have uh, my, this is my personal email because I'm changing jobs. So it's my personal email and cell phone. You are welcome to use those and reach out to me at any time. Um, Chloe, is there any specific questions in the chat that you want me to address before we jump off of here? I don't see any at the moment, but um, does anyone have any questions? And and please know that you'll get um, a link to those slides that has Sarah's information. So maybe if you have a very specific question um, about a specific circumstance that you'd like her opinion on, I'm sure she'd be happy to assist. But oh, let's see. I always forget there's like a Q&A. Oh, can you share the slide? Yes, I, I will share oh, the slide. Oh, gotcha. I yes. do that all the time, too. Sometimes I can't type as fast as people that are, are presenting <laughs> or talking. So. That's um, right. And did we get Star Commonwealth in here? Let me type this in here really quick. Great resource if you aren't familiar with them. Whoops. If you aren't familiar with Star Commonwealth, I really recommend that you check it out. And I think it's www.star.org. I think that's the, that's the site. So um, just some great trainings and great examples for um, resources. And I did find a, a version of the video that you tried to share Sarah, but if you have an exact link that you'd like, I think just the, the animation was a little bit different. Um, yeah, and uh, Dr. Harris actually has several, he has some new ones about trauma and yeah. even some about COVID that are out right now that are just great. But if you just go to YouTube and you search um, the hand model of the brain, uh, you'll find the one from by Dr. Russ Harris. And then you'll find a bunch of other stuff from him. So okay, good. So you'll fall in the, ra the rabbit hole on YouTube, right? Is yes. What you usually say, Marion said, "Great job, Sarah." Oh, great! Thanks, thanks. for joining us, Marion. Um, but if there are no questions, I'll go ahead and and let Sarah jump out of here, um, and let you all jump out also. But thank you so much yeah. for joining us. Um, if you think of any questions, always know that the emails that go out to you all, um, go to my email address. Um, so feel free to always just reply and ask questions there and I'll be sure to get them answered by the appropriate person on our team. But thank you, Sarah, for sharing 
all of that. You're welcome. I was so interested the entire time, just like, what? What? Thinking like <laughs> back on on the your your example about the airplane is exactly how I get on airplanes where I'm moving the vent and I'm like trying to figure out how to relax. So now it all makes sense <laughs> a yes. little bit more. Because amygdala has taken over your body right then. Right. right. So I just need to figure that out. But thank you again for sharing. And thanks everyone for joining us. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Sarah, I hope you have a great weekend. And right. we'll see you at we'll see you soon, I'm sure, even yes. though you're transitioning over. We'll have to get together yeah. sometime. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Bye everyone. Have a great weekend.